Welcome to Back to the Bible. Hi, I'm Woodrow Kroll, and Tammy Weiser is here with me. Uh, we have some folks who have joined us in the studio audience as well. And for the next half hour, we're going to consider what the Bible has to say about studying prophecy. Tammy, this is something we don't often do here at Back to the Bible, but we're beginning a personal Bible study today that will last several weeks. And that personal Bible study is on a very, very favorite book of a lot of people. So a lot of people go through their lives without ever thinking about prophecy or studying Revelation. Mm -hmm. They kind of avoid that book a little bit. Why should we be interested in this? (laughs) In fact, some people avoid it like the plague because, you know, the book of Revelation evokes a lot of discussion. It evokes a lot of dissension sometimes. And there is more than one way to look at the book of Revelation. Now, one of the things we want to do this week is we want to look at the various methods of interpreting the book of Revelation. Because you may interpret it one way, and your husband interpret it a different way, your pastor interpret it a different way. This is one of the great things about this book. It is alive, it is living, and it's very, very vibrant. However, obviously, there is only one way the book was intended to be interpreted. And I'm not suggesting any of us knows for sure what that one way is. I'm going to pick a method during the course of this week, and we will interpret the Bible, the book of Revelation, that way. But you may disagree with that, and that's all right. I'm not here to evoke your debate. There are lots of websites that evoke debate. I'm here to simply tell you what I believe the Bible says, what I believe the Bible means by what it says, and how I believe it can impact your life. Now, today, Tammy and the rest of you, we especially want to think about some of the mistakes that people make when they read the book of Revelation or when they interpret the book of Revelation. This is important because there are lots of folks who stay away from this book because they've witnessed mistakes made by other people. There are lots of crazy interpretations, lots of date setting that people say the Lord has to return by Tuesday the 23rd. And because of that, I think some people have said, no, that's not for me. I'll just leave the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible and never discuss it. Well, we want to discuss it, and we're going to discuss it here and back to the Bible over the next several weeks. Let me suggest to you some of the mistakes that people make, and we don't want to make these same mistakes. That's why I'm beginning today talking about what we should not do before we get into studying the book itself. One of the mistakes I notice people make is that people sometimes study Bible prophecy for the sole purpose of discovering some new thing, you know? They can't discover some old thing because, well, that's already been discovered, but they study Bible prophecy because they want a new interpretation. They want a new angle on things. They want to have a new understanding of who the Antichrist is, for example. And sometimes they have a whole new system of interpreting the Bible based on their understanding of a few verses in the Bible. Let me suggest something to you. I want to read from Acts chapter 17, just one verse. This is not the book of Revelation. This is the account of Paul when he was in Athens, and he was dragged before the philosophers on the top of Mars Hill. Listen to this. It says in Acts chapter 17 at verse 21, For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, the new always intrigues us, doesn't it? We don't want to think about the old. We want to think about what's new. But Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And some people approach the book of Revelation thinking that I'll be the first. There's the thirst to be first. I'll be the first to have a new interpretation of the book. Or or perhaps there's the thrill of novelty. I'm going to take and set aside everything the history of the church has believed for 2,000 years, and I'll strike out in a new path with a new interpretation. Some people just fail to understand the body of truth that's given to them. Remember Paul said to young Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He said, I want you to commit to faithful men and women the things that have been committed to you. Now, what Paul was encouraging Timothy to do was not to try to find something new. What he was encouraging to do was pass on a body of truth from one generation to the next. Here's what I see as a problem in the 21st century. We are so enamored with what's new. We haven't learned yet what's old. We haven't passed on a body of truth from one generation to the next. And if you live by new interpretations, if you live by new insight, if you live by new concepts that you and you alone have, you're living in shaky ground. Someone has said that he who lives by the crystal ball soon learns to eat ground glass. 
if you're just living by crystal balling the book of Revelation without the benefit of the rest of Scripture, that's a mistake that we don't want to make here. We want to find out what the Bible has to say, but it has to say something in context with the rest of the book. Now, the first mistake we don't want to make then is we don't want to approach the book of Revelation just to discover something new. There is another mistake I think some people make in their study of the Revelation, and that is they come to conclusions about how to interpret the book of Revelation, and then they use those conclusions as the basis for their fellowship among other Christians. And I want to tell you right now, many of you will not agree with some of the things I interpret in the book of Revelation. But I hope you'll cut me a little slack, and I'll cut you a little slack too, that we can disagree and still have fellowship in the gospel. One of the things we ought not do is make a test of fellowship our eschatology. We ought not say, this is how I interpret the future, and I'm only going to fellowship with those who interpret the future this way too. You know, the early test of fellowship in the church was not eschatology. It was the apostles' doctrine. Remember what it says, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. He said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, that doctrine, that apostles' doctrine was very, very young at that point. This is Acts 2. The church is just being born at this point. So the apostles' doctrine, for the most part, was what Peter had to say in his sermon on that Pentecost Sunday. As a result of that... They had fellowship, and that had nothing to do with eschatology. So let me encourage you not to make your understanding of the future a test for fellowship for people around you. I think the key to fellowship is always salvation. We can fellowship with others who express genuine faith in the Savior. And we can disagree with them. You will disagree with some things I say. I will disagree with some of the uh, propositions that you probably will make as well. But that's the great thing about being a Christian. We can disagree disagreeably. We don't have to be ugly in the way we disagree with things. Let me read a passage to you from 1 John. In fact, if you have a Bible and would like to follow along, I'd encourage you to do that. 1 John chapter 1 talks about the basis for our fellowship. It's a mistake, I think, for us to base fellowship on anything other than faith. Here's what it says. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now watch, he's talking about eternal life here, not the understanding of the future. That which we have seen, verse 3, and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, what's the basis of their fellowship? That which they had heard that relates to eternal life. Skip down a couple of verses to verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. So again, every time you find this concept of, with whom should I have fellowship in the church? The basis is not the minutia of our understanding of prophecy. The basis is always our understanding of faith. We don't want to make that mistake. And as we go through the book of Revelation throughout the next several weeks, there will be issues that we cannot say with great clarity. In fact, through the course of this week, I want to talk with you about two great ways to interpret the book of Revelation. I'm going to choose one of those. Some of my friends may choose another. I disagree with them, but I still can have fellowship with them. Why? Because they're believers just like I am. So don't get sidetracked with things that don't relate to the truth. That's a mistake we dare not make. There are some people who get sidetracked on the Antichrist and they miss the real thing. We want to find out who Jesus is in the book of Revelation. More in a moment with Dr. Kroll here on Back to the Bible. You know, people try all kinds of things to figure out the future. 
psychic hotlines and horoscopes, even fortune cookies. It's amazing how desperate people are to know what's going to happen. But the truth is, the only reliable place to learn about the future is the Bible. This summer, Dr. Kroll is talking about Bible prophecy, and specifically in the book of Revelation, and he's written a brand new Bible study called The Glorified Christ that you can use as you follow along with his messages and for your own personal study of Revelation. The Glorified Christ is totally user-friendly, and it's like a tour guide that'll take you through the tough book of Revelation, explaining the sights and the sounds, and it uses easy-to-understand language. So if you've ever wanted to understand Revelation better, you need the glorified Christ. Now you can get the glorified Christ Bible study with your gift of any amount to Back to the Bible. So call us toll free at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or, of course, you can send your gift to Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Again, that's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Or you can log on anytime to backtothebible.org. Now let's go back to Wood. Now anytime you undertake something like the study of a book, like Revelation that is apocalyptic in nature. It's open to varying interpretations. We have to make sure we apply the right principles of interpretation so that we come out with the right information. We get the right interpretation. We know what John meant when he wrote these things in the book of Revelation. Let me suggest to you five principles for studying Bible prophecy. Some of these things are just common sense things. They all come out of the Bible, but they're common sense things. And we want to make sure as we study the book of Revelation over the next several weeks that we apply these principles in a way that makes sense and is faithful to the text of Scripture. Principle number one is this. When you and I study Bible prophecy, we should never read the Bible through the newspaper. In other words, don't let CNN interpret the Bible for you. There are lots of people who do that, you know. They have an understanding of Scripture, but they check the news today to find out whether that understanding is correct. And if the news changes, their interpretation of Scripture changes. That's the wrong way to go about understanding the future. So don't let the newspaper color your understanding of the Bible. So one of the things we're not going to do in this study is we're not going to make reference to a lot of current events. You know, Katrina came. That's a great uh, disaster. The tsunami came. The Bible has something to say about these things. But that doesn't necessarily mean Christ has to come back before the end of this series. So we're not going to read the Bible through the newspaper. We're going to read the newspaper through the Bible. Principle number one. Here's principle number two. Don't link the Bible to every cataclysmic event that occurs in history. In other words, there have been a lot of people who have made predictions based on some natural disaster that occurred in the 1800s or the 1900s or in the 20th century. And we're doing the same thing in the 21st century. Every time there's a natural disaster, every time there's a tsunami like there was the day after Christmas a couple of years ago, every time there's a Hurricane Katrina, every time there's an earthquake in Turkey or in Japan or in Pakistan, every time something like that happens, some people get all exercised about that and say, aha, there you go. We have to interpret the Bible a certain way based on this event. That's as bad as interpreting the Bible through the newspaper. Now, look, Jesus said, and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. That's Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. Now, if this is just the beginning of sorrow, then, I don't think we ought to see every natural disaster as indicative of the fact that God is now opening up the Pandora's box and the rest of the book of Revelation is going to roll out of that natural disaster. The problem is we've been doing that for generations 
And it's a classic case of overkill of enthusiasm. Do earthquakes relate to Bible prophecy? Absolutely. Does every earthquake that ever occurs relate to Bible prophecy? I don't think so. So one of the principles of interpreting Bible prophecy is not to link prophecy with every cataclysmic event that occurs in the world. We're going to try not to make that mistake as we study Revelation over the next several weeks. Well, here's principle number three I want you to keep in mind. Don't be afraid, when you're thinking about Bible prophecy, don't be afraid to read those with whom you disagree. You know, there are some folks who fall into one camp of interpretation, and they never read anybody in the other camp, because I think they're afraid that they might change their mind. (laughs) Don't be afraid to read people with whom you disagree. But on the other hand, don't accept their interpretation without a challenge from their equals. You know, there are lots of folks who will raise challenges to the way I might interpret Scripture. And my job is not to say, oh, well, I can't answer that, therefore there must not be an answer for that. But that's not true, because I can't answer it doesn't mean someone can't answer it. So don't be afraid to read people who may disagree with you or with whom you may disagree, but don't automatically accept their interpretation simply because you don't have an answer for it. This is an issue that has been a part of the church since the day of Pentecost, We're not going to solve this issue in our understanding of Revelation in the next several weeks. Now, two more principles I want us to follow. Here's principle number four. Pay close attention to little things. You know, the Bible's a big book. There are 66 books here. There are a lot of chapters in each of these books. There are a lot of words in each of these chapters. And sometimes we read over things that would help us in interpretation if we only paid attention to the little things. Let me give you a great example. There's great controversy over how to interpret Matthew 24 and 25. That's one of the portions of Scripture that divides Christians in their interpretation of the future. And here's a verse out of Matthew 24. Verse 29 says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, let me stop there. Because while those are words you and I would read right over, because the next words are, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken. We're so enamored with the sun being darkened and the moon being blotted out, we forget the obvious. Now, what was the obvious in this verse? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. We can get some sense of timeline here by paying close attention to little things. When will the sun be darkened? When will the moon not give its light? It will happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, there are some people get that backwards. They think the tribulation is coming at the end of all this, or they think there is no tribulation at all. So if you don't pay attention to the little things in Scripture you can fail to understand the Bible correctly. We're going to try to pay attention to little words as we study the book of Revelation, because that's, I think, where the great meaning of Scripture lies. One last principle that we want to follow over the next several weeks studying this book together, and that is we need to keep place references in mind. You know, when the Bible talks about a certain place, we need to make sure that we don't forget where that place is. Everything has to happen someplace. And if it's happening in heaven, that doesn't necessarily mean it's happening here on earth. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Verse 11 says this, Then I saw heaven opened. Okay, automatically my attention now is on a place. It's heaven. And a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. If my understanding is correct, this is the Lord Jesus that's talking about here. But if my understanding is correct, he's also in heaven when it's talking about him. Why? Well, because that's what it said. I want to keep place references in mind. Now, it talks about him coming out of heaven, the saints coming with him, and him making war against the evil forces of this world. All of that relates to a time when Jesus is in heaven, but comes to earth. So my understanding of the future has to square with what the Bible says are the place references. Jesus can't be doing things on earth if he is in heaven. 
And he isn't going to be doing things on earth while he's in heaven. So one of the things we have to do as we study the book of Revelation is keep place references in mind. We will pay close attention to that because I think a lot of people go astray in their understanding of Scripture simply because they don't pay attention to the little things. Hey, grammar is important. Words are important. They are the vehicles by which we communicate meaning. And if we want to understand the meaning of the book of Revelation, we're going to have to follow some principles that lead us to truth. That's our goal over the next several weeks, to follow the principles that lead us to the truth of the book of Revelation. Terry, you have a question. You uh, talked a little bit about not being afraid to read, uh, I suppose, prophecy books of Mm -hmm. uh, other people you don't agree with. I've always been um, real careful about reading any books that deal with the Bible or Jesus or anything that are not of my faith. Is there a reason I should read these books you're talking about? I think one of the reasons you do read people who hold other opinions from your own is to strengthen your own opinion. You know, Let them challenge your faith. If the unexamined life is not worth living, then the unexamined faith is not worth having either. So I read people who disagree with me simply to let them challenge me and my own thinking to make sure that my thinking is correct. And uh, again, the way you find out if a person is someone you might agree with is the first thing you do when you pick up a book is read the author's information. Find out who this person is. Because generally, you may not know who this author is. And you can determine pretty quickly where that author is going to come down on which side of the fence with regard to theology or with regard to eschatology simply by knowing a little something about that author. Well, it's going to be an exciting study, and I'm glad that you're here to enjoy it with me. And you at home, I hope you'll be able to take some time on a regular basis to check in with us here at Back to the Bible to see how we're doing in our study of the book of Revelation. I'll be back in just a moment to close. So you've got the Antichrist, the number 666, violence, horrible plagues and wars. Kind of sounds like I'm talking about the latest release from Hollywood. Actually, all of these things and a lot more are found in the book of Revelation. Dr. Cole's taking us on an interesting journey through Revelation this summer here on Back to the Bible. And we want you to get as much as possible from Wood's messages. And that's why we're offering Dr. Cole's brand new Bible study called The Glorified Christ. The Glorified Christ is a must-have if you're looking for a clear and complete understanding of Revelation. And it's full of easy-to-understand language, and it has some great insights. So call us today and ask for the Glorified Christ Bible Study, and then follow along with Wood as he takes us on a journey through the incredible last book of the Bible. You can get your copy of the Glorified Christ Bible Study with a gift of any amount to Back to the Bible. So to order this study, call us at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425, or visit our website, it's backtothebible.org. And of course, we do still accept mail from the post office, so if you prefer, send your support to Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Again, that's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Now let's go back to Wood. Well, thanks for being here today. I hope our study of Revelation over the next uh, couple of months will be of benefit to you. You know, some people think of Revelation as a book that's uh, pretty scary, a lot of scary stories in it. And there are lots of frightening images. But it's also a promise of hope for those of us who know the Lord Jesus as Savior. So if you've never done an in-depth study of the book of Revelation before, why don't you commit to joining me each day over the next eight weeks as we study this prophecy together. I think we'll both benefit. Well, thanks for being here today. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about why did God reveal the future? Is it important you and I know what's going to happen in the future? Can we just live our lives knowing what's happening around us today? That's tomorrow. You're in Back to the Bible. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. I'm Woodrow Kroll. Have a good and godly day.